Okay, everyone, welcome to the graduate art student presentations. My name is Erica Spade and I am a third year graduate painter. I am from a small town in central Pennsylvania near State College. It's called Coalport. I received my Bachelor of Fine Arts from Slippery Rock University in 2019. And that was only about a year after I started painting with the identity of a painter. So here's just a photo of me with no mask on and my two cats, Ling Ling and Obi, as well as some additional information on where I'm from. From my very first painting, landscape as a subject was always second nature to me. It was always my inspiration to create because from my earliest memories, the landscape around me has always been a place of many complex qualities that made my mind wander into different places. It's always been my place to escape to, to let loose in, to find myself and to appreciate life again. It's always been the place that I could feel safe to cry, to laugh, to scream, run and get hurt and heal all in the same place. Our world is packed with environments that are welcoming as well as unhospitable. I've always sought comfort in the land because it humbles me, but it also grants me the freedom to try again without judgment. It's an ever changing place that is dualistic in nature. Our environment nurtures growth as well as change and it always repairs and grows back after destruction. Learning from the dualities of nature are keys to, the, to growing and adapting in this life of constant uncertainty and change. However, dualities in nature is referring to dualities in both the nature of our environment as well as the nature of self, in this case, myself. First, let's take a look at a few of our environment's dualities. Our world is substantially beautiful, but it's also intimidating in times like natural disasters. It can be so calming to look at, yet it can still be so dangerous simultaneously to exist in. Our environment is vastly uncontrollable, but as many of you may know, we can harness it on a smaller, more intimate level. And overall, our habitat gives us many qualities, all of which reside in the sublime or the ordinary. <clears throat> However, when it comes to the dualities of self, they're much less appealing. Existing as I am has been a constant act of judgment, condemnation, and fearing the inevitable failures we're all set to face in this life. Through personal analysis, I've collected some examples of my dualistic personality traits to share with you all tonight. I try really hard to be present, but I have dissociative tendencies. I'm a really caring individual, but I have many instances where I'm indifferent about everything. I try very hard to be patient, but in times of uncontrollable anxiety, it's really hard to be that way. I try to be focused, but in the times of decision paralysis, it's hard to focus on anything. I am willful, but I'm also depressed. I'm a walking contradiction. These parts of myself are things that I've been too ashamed to accept until now. I've tried to suppress these qualities instead of trying to grow around and with them. Upon these considerations, my decisions to utilize the landscape is because of the direct parallel to aspects of my personality. It is my physical representation of non-physical considerations. Just as an active volcano can stand beautifully and harmless one minute, it's still an active volcano set to erupt at any time. And just as I am able to stand confidently, I'm still met with challenges that pull me away from confidence into self-doubt and despair. I'm a person who is dualistic in nature, just like our environment. Duality has been the ultimate goal that I've been searching to express while I've been here. This idea has existed incoherently throughout my time here, but it's as if I could only catch glimpses of the whole picture each time I approach something new. And now only in hindsight, am I able to see that I was providing myself pieces to put together later. I was searching for ways to express and exercise the constant ache of having these dual personality traits. Now, as I stand before you tonight, I'm aware that my subconscious is working very hard to present me with two aspects into one idea. Basically trying to express dualistic qualities of other subjects. This idea was first expressed in a body titled Color Grounds. This body explored emotions and their effects on interpreting life. I used an abstract approach to interpret aspects of the landscape, such as texture and elemental qualities like water, earth, and air. This piece, Fleeting Water, referenced a moving river. 
However, I didn't want to represent it. I wanted to think about the movement of water as I laid down paint. I was trying to express how things could be interpreted one way and depicted in another. <clears throat> Duality next appeared in a small body of work titled Transition. This work acted as a literal transition between color grounds in my current body of work. Transition was work designed to help me appreciate what color grounds had taught me and where and was and while urging me to move forward in the direction I was being pulled. Though this body was small and a quick summer project, it has earned its place in the path to where I'm at today. The key stepping stones begun with color grounds, moving on to transition and into my current body of work called dualities in nature. Dualities in nature is a body of work that balances between abstraction and reality. Reflecting on the duality of myself, I'm expressing this through illusions of landscapes. These landscapes are recognizable with things left to be explored. This body is being created through a meditative process, a process where I'm able to consider the complexities and challenges of my life and work through them. I bring all of my baggage with me into the studio each day and I use it as kindling to burn through each painting session. Perhaps that's the reason that I only ever try to represent the elements of water, earth, and air, it's because the fire is burning inside my person. Dualities in nature is special to me, as this body of work is created out of the love of life while simultaneously dreading each passing day. This is my chance to exercise the distasteful and interruptive emotions and parts of me that I struggle to control. Through each work session, I've come closer and closer to my resolve toward my goal of making paintings that exist between two realities or two states, reality and abstraction. This body is an invitation into the crosshairs of reality and my consciousness. It's my search for sublimity in life while exploring the veils of my own existence. This meaning, while I explore the layers of my subconscious and spirituality, I'm searching for the beauty and divine aspects of life, the parts that make the pain, sorrow, and misfortunes fade away. And now I'd like to bring you all into the process for my thesis body of work. This process begins simply. I start by gathering information through ink studies. These are both observed and intuitive. These studies then act as a sort of reference images for my later paintings. These are made using a Sumier inspired technique. I'm sure you might be curious what Sumier is, and it is a traditional Japanese ink washing technique that has originated way back in 960 AD. This process is very old, but it is still practiced and very active today. It's delicate and requires a lot of patience, attention, and practice to master. However, my usage of Sumier was not to master it, but it was to just learn the ink and brush handling techniques on Bradgell's Wham paper. It was never my wish to use the complete style of traditional Sumier, as I wanted to just learn how to do it properly, that way I could adjust it to my own practice. I used what I learned in ink washing to translate into oil paint. I learned to dilute paint in different concentrations to achieve mark making that, that create luminosity and ethereal mark making. I also started to learn to control the fluid nature of my mixes through gravity. Turning my canvas and lying it flat are two very crucial parts of my current process. This is how I control my washes loosely enough for the slight lack of control while consciously making choices to gain some control back while I'm working. Through different washes of paint and working in layers, I build up each image to create a sense of landscape. This has been my process since last September. These are two beginning stages for a piece that I'm still currently working on. So in conclusion, this body of work is in the works because of my unconscious yearning to express a part of me that influences every other part of my life. I haven't been able to fully grasp what I've been after until now because I wasn't able to see, understand, or accept myself for the complex person that I am. The dualistic qualities of my personality have made life confusing and some aspects difficult. It has tested my relationships, challenged me, and made me question my overall purpose as an artist. However, these parts of me have also given me many sublime moments of excessive joy and times of gratitude. The dualistic nature of my personality has shaped me into the person that I am today. It's led me to a life that desires an active, 
smearing oily pigments around for fulfillment. For that, I am grateful. I am grateful to be who I am, as contradictory and challenging as it may be. Because after all, I am here today with you all instead of on a construction site or in, a, in an office building. I've become an artist in spite of my doubts and shortcomings. Art has given me the ability to make connections and grow into the person that I am. And besides, what better catalyst is, catalyst is there for us artists than the challenges we face in our daily lives? And with that, I thank all of you for your time tonight and invite you all to my closing reception on April 29th at the 1020 Collective in Erie for Dualities in Nature. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, then without further ado, I will introduce you to Kat Charnley. Oh no. PPTX. Um, Is Keynote not on this computer? Um, I mean, I guess I can export it. I have my laptop, so I can, I can change the file. I don't know if you guys want to look. Should be on, yeah. I mean, I see a red I mean, light. Yeah. Can we open up another one? Uh, it is currently
Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out to hear us all speak tonight. My name is Kat Charnley and I'm a third year MFA student here. Um, I'm a printmaker and I'm gonna be talking to you about my experience as a grad student here. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a 27 year old female from Rochester, New York. I'm a big animal lover. You can see my rescue dog Daisy and cat Diesel on the screen. I received my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Drawing from SUNY Brockport in 2017. I dipped my toes in printmaking when I was there and discovered that to be my preferred medium. After I graduated, I fell into a little bit of a rut. I was not making art and I was also not making healthy life decisions. So I decided I wanted to change my routine. I got involved with an animal shelter where I volunteered to walk dogs three times a week and that greatly improved my mental health. So much so that I decided I need to make a bigger life change. I would do this by going to grad school with the goal of expanding my artist practice and eventually becoming a teacher. I decided to attend Edinburgh University because of the faculty, the well-equipped print shops, and the close proximity to bigger cities. The graduate assistantship was also a deciding factor as it helps lessen my financial burden. In order to get in the right mindset for school, I decided to go to an artist workshop. I chose to attend Woodcut Boot Camp because of advice I received from my undergrad print professor, Deborah Fisher. Woodcut Boot Camp is a nine day intensive workshop where attendees live in the print shop, they draw, carve, and print a large scale wood block. It's hosted by Tom Huck, a large scale woodblock printmaker in St. Louis, Missouri at his shop called Evil Prints. Students watch demos by Huck, get insight into his artistic process and get to pick his brain about his experiences as a working artist. We also got to see his work up close and personal. Initially, I was really intimidated to go because it was out of my comfort zone, but my anxieties quickly faded. The atmosphere was energetic. The space was filled with print memorabilia collected over the years and everybody was ready to get to work. Before going, I decided what I wanted to make my print about and it was really more of a need than a want. I had been reflecting on the time I spent at the animal shelter and all of the dogs I encountered there that suffered at the hands of humans. Cabbage Snatch Pup depicts a dog, Gigi, who, had, who was neglected, overbred and on a treatment plan for her mastitis. Volunteers would hold red cabbage on her teeth to naturally draw out the infection. The forms behind her reference the heaps of dogs who are euthanized in city shelters every year due to, largely due to human neglect. This piece was cathartic to make and, want, and would serve as a starting point for my graduate work. Fueled by my rage for the way animals can be neglected by society, I started researching other industries that commodified the lives of animals. The first piece I made in grad school was Drazy, Blinded by Beauty. This piece depicts a human undergoing cosmetic testings that is regularly practiced on animals. By inserting a person, I provide opportunity for the viewer to feel empathetic, to feel an empathetic approach when considering animal cruelty. Making this piece felt really negative to me. Even though I was discussing a topic I felt strongly about, I felt like I was taking a, more of a guilt trip approach and I considered if there was other ways to visualize my ideas. Most of my first year, I was unsure about my visual language, what I wanted my audience to take away from my work and the exact message I was trying to send. The one thing I did know was I wanted to make connections between humans, animals and the natural world. Despite my insecurities, doubts, and imposter syndrome, I knew I had to keep making, playing, and experimenting to find what I was looking for. Even though I did not like mo most of what I made, I didn't stop. I had adopted the mentality that regardless of how insufficient I may feel as an artist at times, I must keep growing, learning, and participating in as much as possible. Something I've been very fortunate to be a part of during my time here is our fine arts publishing company, Egress Press and Research, which, which is run by Bill Mathy and Doug Eberhardt. Generally, Egress hosts one visiting artist per year who visits for one week. While they're here, they develop an image to, do, to be produced as a limited edition and pulled print. The artist makes all the visual decisions about the print and the Egress team finishes the printing after their stay. On the bottom left is Tommy Coleman's print, They Miss Your Labor, Not Your Love. 
He made and printed the etching, signed off on how it should look, and then I printed the addition after he left, which is a limited specified number of multiples. Working with these artists provides an opportunity to gain insight on their practice. Since I've been here, Egress has had an exponentially larger amount of visiting artists than in the past due to our connection with Erie Arts and Culture. This local nonprofit has a new visiting artist every month, many of whom we've had the pleasure of working with. I've been fortunate to be able to network with these artists and remain in contact with many of them. Some of the prints we made, including one by Hiromi Manihan, picturing the dual heads, was included in 2021's Art Basel Miami. Art Basel is an international art fair hosted annually that connects galleries, collectors, and artists. Working for Egress Press and Research helped me become a proficient printmaker, taught me how to approach working with other artists, as well as maintaining boundaries and expectations with others. Besides from gaining experience as an artist, I was interested in getting teaching experience as well. I asked Doug if he had any suggestions and he referred me to Pittsburgh Center for Arts and Media. I reached out to the community center and they took me on as a course instructor. I was really nervous at first, but like with everything else, I knew I had to get out of my comfort zone in order to grow. Ultimately, it went well because I was prepared and knowledgeable about the material. I've taught screen printing, reductive printmaking and collagraph printmaking with them and my confidence in instructing has greatly improved. I've also networked with some of my students and other instructors, and we've been able to help each other out with opportunities. I've done several artist markets at Pittsburgh Center for Arts and Media and was commissioned to do this shirt design as well. At this time, school was excited, school was exciting, and I was involved in a lot and having a good time. Then the pandemic happened. In isolation, I reflected on my work and the connections I saw between humans and animals and contemplated that regarding my visual language. I was also thinking about solitude, isolation, and interior spaces and the items we surround ourselves with for comfort. I thought about coping mechanisms, pleasures that people partake in, and how these actions are perceived with varying degrees of acceptability, both socially and individually. That's where my inspiration for herd brewing came from. An isolated figure killing time with two of the most accepted and abused vices in our society, social media and alcohol. The figure scrolls through their feed, ingesting the information provided without second guessing it like a sheep in the herd. Paper crane circle above, reminiscent of a concussed cartoon character I used to watch on TV, but also relating to their origin story. It's told that constructing 1,000 paper cranes will bring true one's greatest desires. This speaks to our ability to take control of our situation regardless or despite of the circumstances. Even though we were in a pandemic, my growth would not be stunted. I brought this concept into my next piece when I learned lithography, which was completely revelatory to me. I fell in love with the direct translation between the mark making on the stone and the printed image. Lithography is the process of drawing with a greasy crayon on a leveled limestone. The image is etched in the stone using a solution of nitric acid and gum arabic that's concentration is specific to the value on the stone. This creates a memory of the image in the stone surface. The gum arabic adheres to the non-image area and helps it hold water. The drawing material is then replaced with printing base and etched again. To print, water is applied to the stone. The greasy image area repels the water while the non-image area holds it. When the ink is rolled on the stone, it only sticks to the greasy area. Then it's sent through the press and a print is pulled. I felt like I was onto something with this body of work, so I continued with my concept, making connections between human experiences and cultural interpretations of animals. I also got familiar with lithography and worked on honing my skills. 
Around this time, Print Club hosted Gregory Santos, a lithographer for a visiting artist lecture. He talked about mixed grit, a print exchange where he mails litho stones to artists who draw on them, mail them back to him, and he processes and prints them. Each participating artist receives a print from everybody involved. This inspired undergrad Zofia and I to do our own version called Scarab Etch. Artists were selected from campus to create a litho. They would draw and we would print it. In the end, everybody would end up with a print from one another. Scarab Etch allowed me more experience etching and printing than I would have had were I only processing my own drawings due to the fact that I'm an exponentially slow drawer although I have been improving on that recently. Other than the printing I did for Scarab, I was able to gain other master printing experience with some of the connections I had made. I printed some dry points for Casey J. Swazinski of Erie Arts and Culture and Corey Thompson, a local tattoo artist, to name a few. Although I had a lot of extracurriculars going on at the time, I was momentarily unsure where my art should go next. I had thought I would continue with my last series, Vices and Virtues, but that didn't feel right anymore. I had some classes coming up that I needed to prepare demos for, so I did some non-conceptual, traditional tattoo-inspired prints. I really enjoyed making these, and I thought, why shouldn't I keep doing this if I like it? I actually ended up going through some of my old sketchbooks, and I found some flash I previously drew. I had this interest all along and I had been ignoring it because I didn't think it was art school appropriate. No more would I try, try to force what I made fit into some fake guidelines I had created for myself. After all I had learned so far, I realized I could trust my intuition and draw how I want to. This brings us to boot camp, advanced woodcut boot camp uh, last summer. I made this chiaroscuro print and it felt like I was going in the right direction. This is the planning process I use to make this print, which I use for most of my prints. I come up with an idea or a concept, I look up reference materials for my drawing, I make my drawing, and then I transfer it onto the matrix. I then carved it and I printed it. Color mixing is also a crucial component to my process. After completing this print, I left boot, I left boot camp feeling excited and rejuvenated. Come fall 2021, I was invited to participate in a print exchange called Strain Separations, Reflections on a Global Pandemic. And selfishly, my biggest gripe at the time was my lack of studio access. After all, I moved here specifically for that and I didn't have it. So I made this print as a projection of myself. I enjoyed making this print so much that I decided to expand it into a series as part of my thesis. Cerebral disconnect explores the feeling of being disconnected from one's body and disassociated with reality. You can see my process where I start with a loose sketch. I refine my sketch. I turn it into a print where I print the key layer and then I print transparent color layers over top of that. The second component of my thesis includes large scale narrative prints that draw on my use of symbolism for storytelling. I used inspiration from old school American tattoos for my image for the way I simplified my drawing and color choices. To, to make this, I implemented the same process I always have across all bodies of work, but I started to take more liberties with my drawing. Here you can see my reference material, initial sketch, and final print. This brings us to the last component of my thesis work a series to depict pivotal moments in my life that define who I am today. These bold designs use animal symbolism to represent a feeling or a state of mind that is universal across all sentient beings. For example, the bald eagle is symbolic of honor and integrity. I use it to represent the moment I decided to trust my intuition, value my self-worth, and embrace my art interest outside of academia. This is the moment I knew a career in academia was not for me and it energetically sought out a new path. My work has changed while I've been here and that's directly correlated to my personal growth. My work is much more about me than it ever has been before and that's due to my self-worth growing from constantly being outside of my comfort zone and being open to opportunities and change. 
I learned if you stick it out long enough and trust your intuition and truly care about what you do, things come full circle in the best ways. Although I only wanted to give you a peek at pieces for now, I wanna invite you to come to my closing reception of formative moments, my thesis exhibition presented at the 1020 Collective at 1020 Holland Street in Erie on April 29th at 7 p.m. As far as post-grad plans, I do have some things lined up that I'm not going to disclose yet, but what I will share with you is I will be in St. Louis for the whole month of July doing both boot camps um, with Tom Huck. So if anybody is trying to go to boot camp, come through, I'll be there. It's gonna be a great time. If you wanna follow me to stay up to date on any of my activities, feel free. And thank you for listening to me talk. Anybody have any questions? Okay, well, without further ado, I would like to introduce Vicki. Hello everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is oh, you weren't sharing the screen. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Whenever you guys close the window, it it stops the share screen. So let's go back to the top. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the PowerPoint. Let's Sorry, I don't use a Mac. <laughs> okay, round two. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Vicki Brannigan, and I'm a third year medals graduate student finishing my last semester here at Edinburgh. To give you a little bit of background on my previous work and where I came from, I moved here from Rock Hill, South Carolina, where I graduated with my BFA in jewelry and metal smithing from Winthrop University. For my undergraduate thesis, I constructed these three copper boxes. The outside of each four by six and five by seven box was etched with delicate lace pattern and sat atop handmade pillows. The inside of the boxes were etched with very personal journal writings filled with insecurities about being an artist, being young and everything in between. This piece is titled Passion, Success and Failure. During undergrad, I was struggling to find my own voice and artistic style within my work and made these boxes either both a response and physical interpretation of those feelings. This is my pinnacle, super dark and moody art moment that I think everyone <laughs> goes through in some way or another during art school. And I promised myself when I finished these boxes that I never make work with text again. I thought it was too direct and uncreative. And in the end, I felt like it was kind of limiting. So when I arrived at grad school here at Edinburgh, I wasn't exactly sure where to start, and I felt the need to step back a bit and focus on formal qualities and material exploration. I was still very lost and very fresh out of pouring my literal soul into those boxes. And I had just moved across the country to a new state and, and I was finding myself craving structure. I was lucky enough to also be working at the GI in the wood shop with Karen Ernst and discovering wood as a material to make art and not just construct armatures was exciting beyond words. All of this was being translated into my work as blocks and tight fitting orientations. And I was trying to experiment with methods of combining wood with metal. I latched onto wood very quickly, both for the material and for the processes involved. Carving rapidly became my favorite meditative activity. And all I wanted to do is figure out a way to make wood elements more exciting in jewelry. However, during this time, my studio and my school and studio environment was changing. 
And I, like everyone else, was feeling the pandemic blues, and I found comfort working with textiles in my non-studio time. Ever since learning to crochet, and so at a young age, I've always used these activities as a relaxing pastime and firmly resisted the idea of adding textiles to my studio work. But as home life and work life quickly became one and the same, and after some encouragement from my professors, from the first time I really considered the idea of using these elements in my work. But before I get too deep into this work, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't first introduce to you these two wonderful women. My grandmother and great grandmother tell me everything I know about fabric and yarn. My great grandmother, or as I called her, Grandma Jersey, was a master seamstress for over 50 years. And my grandmother was an ER nurse who for her entire career would literally crochet and knit patients socks and hats during downtime at the hospital. And if that doesn't scream wholesome, I really don't want does. Um, <laughs> I grew up with military parents and my family moved around quite a bit of the child. Because of this, there always seemed to be a little bit of craziness happening at every given moment. I knew when either of them came to visit, I could count on the fact that they would take me away for the time being just so I could play with yarn. They gave me calmness and comfort during some of the most hectic periods of my life. So I began to really think about the relationship between these materials and what I wanted to say with them. The meditative process of making has always been the main thing that drives me to create art. It felt natural to be utilizing the techniques and materials I'd always been the most familiar with, but I was struggling to insert content into my pieces. I was pulling at straws a little bit, just hoping to expect, just hoping and expecting that working with comfortable materials would just instantly lend itself to amazing show-stopping work. I felt like my work was finally starting to be something I enjoyed making, but my finished pieces were lacking a voice. This piece is titled Be Soft, and it's constructed with walnut, silk yarn and stainless steel. It's the first piece that I began trying to merge these materials into something that made them feel cohesive, but also highlight the differences between them. I needed to dig deeper though, and I needed to understand why I was using these materials and what I wanted them to represent. So I went back again to where they originated. This is my most immediate family. Of course, my grandmother and grandma Jersey as well as my grandfather, my mom, and my dad. As mentioned before, both my mom and dad were in the Navy, which made for a pretty standard Navy brat upbringing for me. We moved from my birthplace of Naples, Italy, to Massachusetts, then Vermont, then Rhode Island, then scooted up to Maine for a bit, then back down to Rhode Island, then all the way to South Carolina once my dad retired. He really couldn't handle the New England snow anymore. <laughs> um, I was raised to always be ready, not to ask questions, and to really just go with the flow to make these transition times easier. And this is my mom. My mom is everything to me. She's a strong military woman who even at standing at a precious five foot two inches on her best day, um, she always knew how and when to stand up for herself. She had the ability to switch it off at any moment though and became the most loving and playful role model. She knows how to laugh even when she's sad and she spreads that same energy everywhere she goes. She taught me to not take everything in life so seriously all the damn time, and that's okay to laugh at yourself every once in a while. My dad taught me how to clean. He taught me how to organize and to work very hard. He didn't always have the softest touch, but he instilled in me the strongest values. And I find myself growing more and more like him every day. My brother DJ, who I was only able to see every few years, did his best to try to remind me it would be okay. It was okay to be a kid, even during stressful times. These intense contrasting roles and role models and personality types that I grew up with are something that I didn't realize had such a strong impact on my own working process until very recently. I realized I wanted these materials to work together, but I wasn't interested in making them seem something like they're not. This piece is titled Too Firm. I found the pellet form extremely beneficial as a way to combine the materials while still maintaining their integrity. And also as a direct reference to the domestic influence I was trying to capture. Making this piece felt, made me feel like I was getting somewhere. At the same time, however, I was still taking wood classes and literally loving every minute of it. I was doing so much introspective and a bit draining work in metals 
And I used Wedshop as a means to play with form, scale, humor, and objects that I was interested in. But that didn't necessarily fit or have a clear connection into my jewelry. I started making objects with an arbitrary bean form and literally couldn't stop. Having this avenue and freedom to experiment and play with this material in a separate body of work allowed me to consistently step back and refocus on the conceptual pieces I was, I was developing metals without burning out from it too quickly. I was still combining materials though, and I was working to maintain the same feel and aesthetic I had been trying to put into my metal pieces thus far. Discovering and falling in love with woodworking is definitely one of the most valuable experiences I'll be leaving here with. My thesis, my thesis was coming up though, and I still didn't know exactly where I wanted my work to say or how I wanted to make my audience feel. And the more I thought about this, the more I realized I didn't know how I felt and what I wanted my work to do for me. So like I've been doing the entire time, this whole grad school experience, I went back home to figure it out. This house you see here is the house my family and I moved into once my mom retired from the Navy. We settled in Rhode Island for the second time and bought this house off the coast of a lake. <clears throat> this was, oh, sorry. Being young, I didn't realize or really understand what retirement meant and all the changes that came along with it. But I knew when we moved into this house that something felt different. This is the first place I lived that instead of being referred to as my uncle's place or my aunt's vacation house or the base. Um, my parents refer to it as their home. I remember not understanding the significance of that statement, but automatically feeling a sense of security and contentment when I heard it brought up in conversation. My dad bought furniture for this house for the first time ever, and my mom let me decorate my room. All of these new things that I never felt like I would experience in my house started happening. This is the first place that gave me any sense of permanence and this is when I realized what I was striving for in my work was much more complex than my family's influence. The feelings I want to emulate in my work are not singular. They're responsive and require interaction. I make brooches because I want these objects to be seen as almost as a badge of honor. <clears throat> Knowing that the content may be undesirable, but still implying the obligation to wear it as an object that everyone will see before they actually see you. This piece is titled No, and it's constructed with powder-coated hand-chased copper, crocheted cotton yarn, and sterling silver. I began my thesis body of work coming out of a pandemic, a breakup, and to be honest, a little bit of therapy. And I realized I was looking for an avenue to express my uncomfortable emotions in a subtle enough way that maintained the level of privacy I prefer to keep in my life. This body of work is an exploration of comfort personal interactions and intimate moments. I'm aiming to establish balance within my materials that emphasize the subtle tension found in vulnerability, forced relationships, and identity. I'm continuously drawn to the, felt, to the pillow form because of the familiarity and versatility it provides. It's universally identified as a comfort item, but can just as easily represent family or intimacy. These pieces with, them, these pieces with my thesis are branded with just some of the personal insecurities and embarrassments and annoyances that consistently populate my thoughts and have a way of ever evolving my, my own personality. This piece is titled You're Prettier That Way. Using maple and cotton yarn with a familiar muted color scheme, I'm still referencing my domestic influence. Sorry. <clears throat> A pillow is overwhelmingly approachable. By simply existing, it has the power to draw someone closer with a baseless promise of being comforting. When developing my thesis work, I had a main question circulating, circulating in my mind. What if it wasn't? This piece is titled, I didn't mean to. The brooch is hand carved solid poplar wood stained and distressed with milk paint. The stylized representation of a common bed pillow carved with the brutal comment of gross on the back gives my intended audience just enough information and probably for some just enough familiarity to understand the context of the moment being illustrated. I want my audience to walk away from my work with a sense of curiosity, empathy, and a certain level of discomfort. What if the one thing that's supposed to guarantee you comfort leaves you feeling embarrassed, ashamed, or even hurt? 
How did that make you perceive trust? How did that make you perceive people? And how did that make you perceive yourself? As someone who prefers to be alone, or at least in a room with four or less people, it was hard to accept the significance that physical interaction with other people has within my life. And furthermore, how drastically my identity has been shaped by the people I surround myself with. I want these pictures, I want these pieces to draw the viewer in with a surface level comfort they provide, but keep people invested with the cryptic, somewhat snarky and underlying themes presented by the text, all while maintaining integrity and proper application of the, mater of the materials and process involved. This brooch is titled, I Know You Mean Well. And again, it's here in Tay's coffer that's been powder coated and accented with cotton yarn and brass rivets. The process of achieving the surface and forms I desire is always meticulous and time consuming. Whether I'm delicately hammering tiny letters into metal or carving a perfect font out of wood, I'm never deterred from taking extra time to make something perfect. That's simply not how I was raised. You may remember me saying at the beginning of my presentation that I promised myself I would never make work with text again. I went back and forth with myself for a long time, wondering if falling back into a comfort zone instead of pushing harder for a new direction with a cop out. However, the more I invested myself into this body of work and dissect everything, every single decision I make for each piece, the more I realized that working with text in this way still makes me just as uncomfortable. <laughs> But pushing myself to make work with the challenge of presenting correct text as a subtle enough to induce curiosity and empathy is much more rewarding and empowering than simply airing out all of my grievances. This last piece titled Duh, made completely out of naturally cracked cherry wood and, con and cotton embroidered thread with a fabricated stainless steel pin stem is one of my favorites in the bunch so far. I hope you can all come out to my thesis show and see the rest of the work in the body of action. My thesis will be exhibited in Bruce Gallery this semester, along with my fellow grad, fellow grad Kimberly Boyce. The opening is on April 6th at 6 p.m. and will be up until the 14th of April. And I hope you can all come out. And if you're wondering, <laughs> if you're curious to what the next thing, next step for me is after graduating, I'm super pumped to announce that I recently and I mean yesterday recently, <laughs> accepted a year-long studio position at Contemporary Craft in Pittsburgh, where I'll be managing wood, metals, and fiber studios and workshops. So if you need me next year, that's where I'll be. And thank you all for letting me speak tonight. Are there any questions? Cool beans. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna introduce my next speaker and close friend, Ashley Pascal. Okay, give me just a moment. I think this should be me. Do I have to hit screen share again? No. Okay, and then do we know how to... Wait, I don't wanna mute it. Huh? No, I know, I just didn't know if it was gonna be in the way. And then what? I'm sorry. Okay. All right, let me just make sure this is gonna work. Cool. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Ashley Paskoff. Thank you for joining us here today um, to hear about all our hard work. I'm a third year MFA candidate in ceramics. I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about myself and then I promise I'll get back to art in a second. <laughs> Here's a couple of my favorite photos. Um, couple things that go on outside of my art. Um, my cat Cleo is on the right, this is backwards. Um, I love her, look at that tongue. On the left is a picture of me with my fiance, Mike McKinney, who I actually met here in graduate school from Erie. And then my best friend, Amy Kay of 11 years in the background. 
In the middle is a picture of me looking very happy. I had just finished a 500 mile hike over the course of two months through Spain. But that's actually not why I'm smiling. I'm actually smiling because of the food, which is my other hobby. <laughs> um, I'm a huge foodie. So it was a pistachio tart, I was very excited. Okay, so I started my ceramics career about 10 years ago at Central Connecticut State University. I went there to study art education, took one ceramics class, one ceramics class, and then swiftly switched to a ceramics major. Um, here, I really learned what it's like to be a part of an artistic community and um, what it means to grow as an artist with other people. And it really changed me as a person and it really convinced me that I wanted to do art and I wanted to work with other people and I wanted to be involved in those kind of communities. On the right is um, just a group of lovely people. <laughs> we used to do an empty bowls fundraiser every year and we'd make up to 400 bowls within four hours and donate them all. And they still do it yearly, which is great. Uh, my professor during this time, who then became my mentor, who then became my supervisor, who then became my friend, is Vicente Garcia. Um, I owe him very many things. Uh, I like to bring up uh, him because he was my first interaction with ceramics. And now he does steel and welding sculptures as well on the right. But on the left, you see a lot of two, two photos of decorative vessels. And this means a lot to my work because this is where I started at as well, you know, mimicking my teacher who introduced me to ceramics. So in undergrad, I did a lot of decorative vases, mostly uh, natural carvings and organic patterns. Um, and yeah, just a lot of bases, many, many bases. <laughs> Near the end of my undergraduate career, I switched over to wanting a bigger canvas. I was obsessed with carving and I wanted something bigger to carve. So I started doing these intuitive organic sculptures. And in my mind, I was always thinking about growth, but I didn't really know what that meant. I was taking wheel thrown forms and combining them and then manipulating them and doing scraffito over the whole thing. This is the best image I have. I wasn't quite great at images yet of my two um, sculptural installations. On the left, I have perennials and on the right, I have seedlings. Uh, I made about 150 seedlings. And yeah, that was my final thing. And it was about, I think, change and transition. But again, I wasn't really thinking much about the forms at this time, just kind of these upward tree-like forms. After this, I moved to Northampton, Massachusetts. And here I learned how to exist as an artist outside of school, which can be a really challenging thing. I worked a bunch of odd jobs. I was an apprentice, a studio assistant. And at this time, I finally got my first little studio space. It was $200 a month. And I taught lessons with kids and adults. And I did workshops. And I had like three or four tenants that were adorable. And I just learned how to be on my own. Pictured on the left and the right are two sisters. They're two of my favorite clients that I used to work with, um, one of which was really anxious all the time. And one of which was very, very mellow, but I loved them. Um, at this time, I also was doing, I was a studio assistant for James Gagina, and he did scraffito, wood fired ceramics, and pottery. And most of his work was functional. And I had always worked in these decorative vessels. And so he really taught me a lot about function. And I just, just loved his scraffito work. I just loved the detail, and it was amazing. So he really was a big step in me becoming a part of the craft fair circuit. So for two years, I did craft fairs for, I don't know, I did 12 or 14 craft fairs a year. So here's an example of some of the work I was making at this time. I did lots of mini vases, bowls, mugs, so many mugs. I was really into feather necklaces for a long time. You can see on the bottom right over there. And so this is what I did for a while while teaching my lessons, while working my odd jobs. At this time, I was doing these craft fairs. You can kind of see my booth set up here. I built all these little shelves. I like this picture a lot because I think it really shows the hustle that is craft fair vending. And you can see how many different types of things I was making at this time. I have feather wall hangings, I have magnets, I have pendants, I have mugs and cups and little bowls on the side. And so it was at this point where I got really burnt out and tired of this. I got tired of making things for money. I got tired of thinking about, will it sell? How will it sell? What's the market of the craft fair I'm going to? 
And so I decided that I was gonna, and I kept thinking about my undergraduate senior work. And I was like, I wanna go back to that. I wanna try and do something new. So I started making these pieces here. I did a bunch of series of these. I was also going through a breakup. So most of these are black. <laughs> But I was thinking about, again, growth and development, but wear and tear and the exhaustion of growing and the difficulty that that, that can kind of take sometimes. I also was putting together a portfolio, portfolio for graduate school. This is one of the last pieces I made before coming to Edinburgh it's called Inchmeal. Uh, I, at the time, was also trying to challenge myself in how I was making things. So being a mostly wheel-thrown potter, I was trying to coil build and hand build everything and also get away from those more craft fair glazes. So here's a rutile patina, which is that hand wash over everything. And this was completely coil built. So at this time, I started at Edinburgh University. Yay, I was very excited, ready to get going. So of course, my first step was to go to my comfort zone. I started making intuitive sculptures as I had been and wood-fired functional pots. And I kind of started in both directions. And I remember one of my first critiques, they were like, well, what did, you know, the piece on the right, they were like, well, what is this, why? And I had very little answers. And so I decided to stick with wood-fired functional pottery because that felt very safe for me. Um, so at this point I said, well, if I'm gonna do functional pottery, if I'm gonna do ceramics, how can I push it? How can I change it? How can I, do what I wasn't doing before. So I started to manipulate these wheel thrown forms as much as I could. I would cut the rim off and re-stick it on and change the body, push it in and out. This, this one here, I was pushing a piece of metal to create those little dots everywhere and then putting inlay over the top, adding little feet, really trying to get out of my box that I had been in. Here's another example of what I was working on yellow bay mug. So I was really trying to make them very funky and weird. Planter. So I was making this funky functional work, but the reality of is, is it was a little bit more funky and a little less functional. <laughs> and so my professors and my committee, you know, they're asking why function, why even bother with it? You know, if that's not important to what you're making. So why don't, you know, you said you did decorative vessels, maybe try to go back to that. So that brings me into my candidacy show, which was unraveling growth. And so I went back to these decorative vessels. So really the only thing that made them functional is that was, there was like an opening at the top of most of the things I made. Here, um, I really went out on a limb with this when I was looking at seed pods, but I was also kind of just, again, using some of my intuitive carving and decorative design. I started to look a little bit at nature because they kept telling me, you know, you talk about nature, but we're not sure how much it's coming across. So I did this vase, orchid vase based off an orchid, loved it, but again, it's the vessel. So then I'm asking myself, what about the vessel is important to me? And I didn't have much to say about it. It was just comfortable. I liked the foot, I liked the belly, I liked the neck. It was something that I had made forever. So again, I'm like, okay, you keep talking about growth and development. Do you wanna try and grow and develop that <laughs> So I did this one and I was like, see, I'm looking at a, at a blooming seed bud and I'm doing this and it's gonna be different. But again, it's the vessel, it's the foot, it's the belly, it's the neck. So I had a very wise professor ask me, you know, you've always done these intuitive sculptures and you've always done vessels, but have you ever tried to make from real life? Have you gone back to the basics and tried to make sculptures that look like the nature that you're looking at? You know, have you physically tried to copy in a sense? And at this point, I decided that I was gonna go back to the basics. Now this brings me to a little bit about myself. This is just a scattering of samples from my windowsill in my studio. Now these have always been there, back to when I was making vessels to now. I'm a big walker, hence my walk through Spain. I walk when I'm bad, I walk when I'm good, I walk when I'm medium, I walk. <laughs> it's my main coping mechanism. And whenever I walk, I'm, a slow walker and I like to pick things up and take many, many pictures that I probably rarely look at or skim through later on, but I'm always noticing things and picking up these little things and I always <laughs> end up with dried twigs in my pocket that I forget about and then later on find them. So at this point I said, why am I not thinking about this that's so important that's been a big part of my life, these little samples? Why have I not been looking at these and 
recreating these forms. So the first step for me of going back to the basics and working from real life was this mushroom. Now it was in my salad and I was like, you know what, why not start there? I wasn't quite ready to get rid of my vessel yet, my vessel functional form. So I made this mushroom serving platter and I went, hey, it's still functional. Um, but also looking at real life, looking at those transitions, looking at natural transitions. Shortly after on one of my walks, I found this seed pod. This isn't the picture of the actual seed pod, but it's a version of it. Um, and I, at the time I didn't know what it was. I was like, what on earth is this? It's called a cucumber magnolia seed pod. And so I made my own version of that. And this was the first piece that kind of brought me into and away from vessels and function. So at this point, I started to look at real life things and images and samples and thinking about my thesis. And like all good artists, I had a mushroom phase because I love mushrooms and they're great and they're very cool. Um, and again, you know, people are asking me why mushrooms? Why, why do you wanna make mushrooms? Why are you looking at mushrooms? And I really didn't have an answer for a while. And I think eventually I got to the point where I realized it wasn't about the mushroom, but it was about what mushrooms do, their processes, how they heal, how they communicate through mycelium, how they're so incredibly adaptive. The one thing that I was having trouble doing, which is change, mushrooms, are, there's so many versions of mushrooms. They are so eclectic in that sense. They really have no bounds, it feels like, in the way that they will adapt. To survive. So I started to think about my thesis and was I going to do mushrooms? Was it about the mushroom? And I realized it was about the processes of nature. So the reason that I always go to nature is because it reflects my life and how I'm coping with things and how I deal with things and what nature does inspires me to be better like nature because it feels like the simplest version of what we are. So I thought about my reaction to the pandemic, my reaction to being in graduate school, my reaction to growing and changing. And I thought about coping me mechanisms. I thought about defense, how we're defensive, how we try to heal and we go back and forth between those things. It was right around this time that I found these gems. <laughs> um, these are leaves that I found on a couple of my walks and they have these growths on them called galls. And at the time I had no idea. And I was like, what on earth are these? So I started researching them and galls are abnormal growths and they can be on flowers, leaves, trees, seeds. And basically it's an irritation on the skin by an insect or um, them laying eggs. And the plant will grow this extra sack of nutrients for the bug. And the bug can live in it and it can lay its eggs in it and it will give it extra food. And then the organism that grew these galls will live and so will the insect that laid that irritated the skin. So it's the symbiotic relationship. And I love it because it looks so like it's not gonna let the plant live. You know, it looks a little scary, but the reality is it's actually saving both of them and it's healing and coping. So I, this was really a big inspiration for my thesis and it's where my thesis is headed. So I have a couple examples of that. This is my first piece I made an inspiration for the images from behind the last image. Um, it's called Under the Skin. And this is right around the last super realistic piece that I made because I realized I needed to put my own creative intention in, in it. But it's an earthenware. It's got a patina wash on it and a glaze. And it was hand built. And I was really happy with it, but I realized it wasn't bringing the pecu peculiarity and the interest that I had that I wanted other people to have because I think nature is fascinating, that's my lens, but how do I get other people to see that? Especially with the environmental climate, I wanted my empathy for the environment to bleed through my art and I wanted that fascination to be seen. So I started to combine different types of plants and organisms that I found. This is again, another version based off of the other leaf we saw. And I, I later learned on they're called lime nail galls these little pink things that come up. So these are my last really two. I tried to brighten the colors on this one. I also wanna tell you a little bit of my process of my process as we finish up here. What I started to do is combine different defense 
or coping mechanisms that I was seeing in photos or finding out in nature. So here you've got two examples. And then this is the product of that. So kind of coming up with my own natural organisms or my own made up fantastical um, botanicals so that the defense mechanism is more important and it's more seen and it's less about recognizable nature. I do also wanna take a side note to mention being in graduate school, the best thing about here is being able to discover other materials. <laughs> um, this piece is um, stoneware, steel and flocking and metalwork uh, has really added a lot to what I can do with what I'm trying um, to make. And I'm really grateful for it. I got into forging just like a few months ago and it's really opened up what I can do creatively. creatively. Um, so I have just a couple more pieces to show you. Another example of my process, these are spiny seed pods that I was looking at and thinking about, you know, how to make them more interesting, how to really make you see how deadly these little seed pods can be and the amount of protection and adaptation these botanicals need to survive. So here's my final product for this. Again, this is bringing in the metal, it's earthenware, flocking, which I'm newly obsessed with. If anybody doesn't know what that is, it's like uh, fabric that you like blow into the air and it lands on glue and it makes this beautiful little soft spot. And then uh, again, I forged copper in this piece as well. And then a white crackle glaze along with a patina and a terracage. So lastly, this is my newest inspiration and it's these spiny leaves. And I think I love them the most because leaves are so thin and delicate and gentle. And then they've got these like thorns that are just trying to get you. And so it's this protection of this very vulnerable thing, which I really enjoy. So this is one of many. I'm planning on making a series for my thesis, um, but this is the first of hopefully many. Again, you've got a uh, earthenware, ongo, patina, and glaze. So I think that's it about me. I hope you guys can all join me for my thesis exhibition, May 2nd to May 7th. My closing reception will be May 6th at 7 p.m. And I will be in Bates Gallery. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, following after me is going to be Lilith, and she's one of our painting MFA students. Okay, ladies. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to my guest talk tonight. I'm Lilith, and I am one of the third year painters in the graduate program here. Tonight, I'll like talk about the content and form of my works, touching on the evolution of my painting process leading to what I'm doing now. First, so, um, a little introduction about myself. Um, my legal name is Du Chongyuan, but I go by Lilith because that's easier to pronounce, I remember. I was born and raised in Wuhan, China for the first, first 18 years of my life. Then after high school in 2013, I moved here to the States um, where I attended Old Dominion, Old Dominion University for my undergrad in Virginia. I was a figure painter throughout my life. Well, throughout my undergrad. Uh, where I was fascinated with narrative art, particularly works that tell the entire story from, from start to finish with a single image. Rather than being direct with what I want to say, it was easier for me to create a fantastical setting where I could mold canvas to whatever the narrative needed. When I first started here in the graduate program, my concept and process was met with some heavy resistance. Everything I was doing was challenged, which resulted in me making a deeper examination of what I was doing. 
Here I realized that I was only scraping off the surface of what I wanted to say with my undergraduate work. I had to question myself as to what my art says about me, what I was doing, what I was giving the audience to read, and what information they should be walking away from my work with. While I was reviewing my own intent and aspiration for my paintings, I was inspired to write imagistic poems to help with building out imageries uh, when I have reached some mental block. The poems being linguistic in nature helps to keep the imagery from getting too literal, keeping my sketches much looser and open to formation. It also helped to streamline my narrative, whereas before I was shoving too many ideas into a single painting like this one, which resulted in a messy metal takeaway. For instance, for this painting, if you were to take everything away but the shoe, the same message will be delivered and the painting will have uh, more of a mysterious outcome. And that's actually better um, instead of what I have here. The quantity of poems made me realize that a series of work that focused on a single thought would produce a much clearer, coherent message. Even still, there were some areas where I could trim excessive elements. I began to visually reduce my subjects little by little, making them more more abstract. This progressed to a point where I realized that I didn't need the full object to be there for it to be recognizable, and that it could still deliver the same narrative that it needs to deliver. As my storytelling and composition progress evolved, I, will, I also went back and examined my concept. Psychology believed that we are all products of our childhood. So I looked into taking imagery that I had drawn nostalgic connections to. I found that figures were too literal, too obvious for the symbology of oneself and too distracting in narrative. So in search of new figures, I experimented with interactions between abstracted objects and birds to explain my childhood experiences. I found the small song birds to be a good vehicle for representing my younger self, having fragility and weakness while also holding the vi vigorous survival instinct of a wild animal. Similarly, childhood experiences often include emotions that are difficult to process for such a young mind. So to accurately depict that, I settled on the abstraction of foreground figures and background settings. Looking back now, I feel that I pushed abstraction too far in some of my work, losing some of the control that I needed to maintain my, walk, my work process. However, I am glad to have discovered ways of creating layers and texture while working on the previous series. Trying the incorporation of cold wax medium with, cold, with oil paint. Um, cold wax, it's different from traditional wax mediums that will be used for encaustics. Cold wax has no resin in it and it does not need heat to dry. So to intentionally create cracks and rough surfaces, I will use a heat gun on the surface to literally burn the surface. Um, and and that, that literally breaks down the surface, creates like a bubbling effect that's kind of ugly to look at and allows more, more like underneath color to show through and um, having more of a dynamic, dynamic texture. Currently, I've decided to pull back on my narrative focus to, and to further explore more formal qualities in my work. For my thesis, I'm exploring color relationships using daily observations as my subject. These objects carry less of a direct narrative, being a little bit more neutral in their approach where they primarily serve as an anchor to reality so that the viewer uh, wouldn't see as an abstract painting and overanalyze my content. I want the viewer to look at a painting in its entirety, and I've taken a few approaches to, 
to encourage that. First, similar to my work with birds, I've removed figures. Humans are so distinct. We can see a slight outline of a silhouette and see it as a full figure. And it immediately becomes a focal point and makes everything else secondary. Next is texture. I've, keep work, I've kept working with incorporate, incorporation of coal wax to disturb the surface, allowing more dynamic color interactions. And third, lines. Instead of creating a shift of planes that cause a change in brightness, I change the color temperature while keeping everything flat in value to bring out the form. So ignoring the rules of atmospheric perspective, the decrease of the depth of field flattens the image, helping the audience to view the painting in its, in its entirety as a single unit. I found that it's important to provide a balance between the active and inactive areas as the texture service and the non-local colors. I have to be careful to not overwhelm the viewer. So while narrative has taken a back seat to the formal elements of my thesis work, this focus on interactions between color and surface is informing me on ways to drive my narrative and works they are largely obscured and abstracted. And I would like to invite you to uh, my thesis exhibition at 1020 Collective in Erie. Um, and my closing reception will be on April 29th and 7 p.m., the same time as gallery night. So thank you very much. And that's the end of my talk. Any questions? As someone who has only seen pictures of your work in the past before, you know, has, has only really seen some of the, the more abstract work that you've been portraying in that career, have you ever considered going back, at least just for you know, a, like a moment, and just like editing it from? I'm like losing my brain. <laughs> like, have I ever considered going back to not like to more smoking. narrative work with like uh, more obvious objects in them? Yeah, like with some of the body support that you've done in your undergraduate career. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I like I still paint figures and draw figures whenever I can, but that's not the main focus right now. The main focus is to um like formally look at color and how colors affects like the overall outcome of a painting. And, um, and eventually I might come back to like doing figures and narrative work, but that's not the main focus right now, if that answers your question. Thank you. And uh, last not but least, we have Kim. Uh, one of our ceramicist grads to bring out to talk about her work. Okay, cool. Hello. I'm Kimberlyn Bloys. I'm a sculptural ceramic artist. I'm from Monroeville, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh. I went to Mercyhurst University in Erie for my undergrad. And these are a couple of my very first ceramics one pieces uh, where I caught the clay bug. I was a work study mixing clay. And um, pretty soon I was in it and I became a research assistant for my professor testing glazes for uh, the last two and a half years that I was there. I also played saxophone in the jazz ensemble while I was there and beat out all the music majors for first chair, which is something I like to brag about. <laughs> uh, so because of my music background during my last year at Mercyhurst, I 
spent some time really diving into making musical ceramic instruments. So up on the screen, we have a hand drum, a big wraparound horn in the middle there, and then some smaller horns on the right. And while I was there, one of my friends in the music department ended up composing something for a few of these instruments with the horn and a few drums and a flute. And we performed that at one point. So that was super cool. After I graduated, I moved to Pittsburgh for a few years. I started out working at a co-op space where I just had a shelf. And then eventually I moved to my own studio space on the right over there. Uh, it's a smaller private space within a larger communal space. So I built a really great community. I also was teaching classes. I taught eighth graders ceramics for a little while, which is, I don't recommend. Um, and I also taught some drop-in classes, some longer term classes. Uh, the studio on the left there is the bathhouse studio in Braddock. It's in the basement of the first ever Carnegie Library, which was a super cool space. So uh, while I was working out of these studios, I was continuing to make musical ceramics. So I started making whistling water vessels a lot. This is one of my favorite ones. It lives in my house. And on the right, there's a diagram of how it works. The one end is open, the other is sort of an inverted whistle. So as you tip the vessel with water in it, the water displaces the air and it gives you this really haunting whistling sound. Love it. Um, I have videos on my website, which is on the last slide. You can check it out later if you're into that. Um, one of the things that I was making the most of were flute mugs. So it's a mug with a hollowed out handle, little mouthpiece, air holes. You can play a little tune on it. It's great. I made so many of them and was selling them at arts festivals for a few years. Um, and I think one year I did about 20 shows and that burnt me out on it real quick. So I decided to go to grad school. Uh, this is one of the first things that I made while I was here. It's a whistling water pitcher. I made it along with a few other whistling vessels and wasn't quite as driven to pursue the idea as I had expected. Um, our first visiting artist, Richard James, came in and kind of gave me permission to just use the time in school to have fun and play. And I said, okay, yes, let's do that. I started looking back at the things that I was making right before I had made musical ceramics. And these are some sculptural teapots. They live in my parents' yard now. And uh, I decided I wanted to explore this idea a little bit more. So I made this huge piece and I was like, okay, cool. This is not the direction that I wanna go in, but I recognized in it what I liked about those pieces. And that's that repetition and rhythm and feeling of movement. So from there, I jumped into these pieces using these flat planes and coils, sort of uh, giving these shapes movement through space, sort of like uh, motion studies. I think of it as like, if you take these snapshots of movement, and you stack them on top of each other and expand them like an accordion. That's what it looks like in my brain. So I started creating my own geometric drawings and then cutting those out in planes and stacking those up. And around this time, I realized that the fragility of the work with that, the super thin planes was extremely important to me. So I made a few pieces that were really super fragile in that they are free stacked. So both of these pieces are like the piece on the left, it's just triangles and they're built up in place. And the one on the right, they're just pentagons stacked against each other crawling across the floor. And if you know that it's terrifying because it's kind of a domino situation. Um, so that was my candidacy show. After my candidacy show in the fall of 2020, I kind of threw myself into material exploration. So I started out with this paper clay experimentation. So paper clay is great because you take the shredded up paper, mix it in with your clay, and then it 
uh, controls your moisture in the clay. So everything dries really evenly. It gives it good strength, which is why I can go to those really thin slabs for a lot of my pieces. So I wanted to test density and weight and strength with all of these different amounts. The image blown up on the right there is the one part clay to four parts paper. So mostly paper, paper burns out in the firing and you're left with this super porous body. So that piece, it's really similar to like a pumice stone and it's super, super light. You can kind of crumble it if you try. So that was interesting. I also tested a ton of colors, made like a thousand test tiles and played around with some gradients to kind of lean into the transitional qualities that I was going for in my work. And then I also started uh, painting slip liquid clay onto pieces of newsprint. And so when you fire that, the newsprint goes away and you're left with these super thin sheets of clay. So you can see how delicate and translucent that is. Decided to run with that idea. This is the first piece that I made with that technique, which is like in my current style. And you can see on the left there, uh, it's still wet, it's just been built. And then on the right is after it has been fired. So it's shifted and it's crumbled and it's really the ultimate fragility there because it has to be on the base. If you touch the piece itself, you are contributing to its destruction. I do plan out all of my pieces pretty meticulously. Each one has these little color cups on the top there. I have 20 to 50 different color points for each of my sculptures and I measure out and tear, cut out my pieces of paper and I build my pieces and still I don't have a lot of control over what happens to them in the firing. For example, this piece here, so in the kiln, since I know that it shifts a lot, I always stack bricks strategically around it to give it support as it inevitably falls one way or another. This one had some that it was leaning on the bricks and during the firing it flipped so that the bricks were on top of it. So you can see on the left there, that spine that was created, which is super cool, but absolutely unintentional, out of my control. And I am really trying to claim that lack of control and just own it and it makes my lack of control in my own life I think a little more manageable a little more comfortable um and so yeah I have a I have a few of these things that I'm confronting in my work about like these things that I'm afraid of this like super fragility of life and you know, I have some pretty extreme anxiety. And I think that confronting these things that I'm anxious about in my work makes it easier to deal with somehow. And I don't expect everyone to have that same experience with my work, which is kind of the beauty of this non-objective stuff, because anyone can read into it whatever they'd like to. A lot of people want to touch it. They really want to touch it. They want to crush it, uh, which I love. A lot of people are afraid of getting too close to it because it's too fragile. And um, I think regardless of what people read into it, it's a pretty interesting and lovely exploration of the ceramic material. So I am ramping up for my thesis show, which will be with Vicki in Bruce Gallery. Um, I have my website, my Instagram. The opening reception is on the 6th. And that is what I have for you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. I 
can't ship them, but I can, yeah. I can drive with them. So it's just, it's just limited. Hmm. Does anyone have any questions for anyone? Oh, yes. Nah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. No, not yet. <laughs> kind of part of it is them being a little bit broken is maybe part of it. Hmm. Um, not yet, but I'm planning on it. Cool. Does anyone have questions for anyone? All right. Well, that is what we have for you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Do I just leave? So maybe push stop recording and then leave. Stop.